this is since 2005 and I started using Snake River briskets probably in 07, 08. And we teach those at every one of my classes. I do 10 regular classes a year and probably about five private. And it's the best of the business. Uh, I will tell you this, I used to think because I could win with anything that you could take a regular old cocker if you went down to Walmart and you could make it into to a uh, good brisket and win, and I did. Because I thought a brisket was a brisket was a brisket. And that's just not so. Um, when I went and tried the first Wagyu brisket from Snake River Farms, there was a big difference. I'm talking about, everybody gets caught up in, man, it's got a lot of fat on it. Well, the fat on the outside of the brisket isn't what you want to be looking at. When you go pick out a ribeye steak out of that meat case, what do you look for? You want that marbling down inside of that meat. You ain't looking for that layer of fat just laying on the top. What you want to see is marbling. That's going to be your flavor. That's going to be your tenderness. That's going to be your moisture for that particular cut of meat, in this case, the brisket. Any of y'all can see up here close, you look at the marbling down inside of this meat right here. When you're talking about the fat that's laying on the top of the fat cap right here on the bottom, I'm talking about the marbling down inside the meat. And I'm going to tell you something. You know, it's not the cheap cut out there. It's not. But you get what you damn pay for. I mean, if you want a damn... Impress if you're in your backyard cooking. This is the deal right here. If you got some kin folks in fact, which I ain't got no kin folks in the family, I want to spend this kind of money. <laughs> I generally let them go out of town and then I cook for myself and get the snake rubber because I don't want them sorry ass bastard damn kin folks eating up my good stuff. <laughs> but I can tell you this it's worth the money. Now, for competitions, I can go ahead and tell y'all that's want to do comps. If you ain't cooking Snake River Wagyu, your ass is going to be last or second or whatever. You, because the competitors, the top teams out here today, everybody is using Snake River Farms Wagyu briskets. Bottom line. Because there is a difference in the flavor of the beef. There is a difference in the tenderness and the moisture content of the beef. I mean, you look at the marbling there. How many folks look at briskets at Walmart and every other big packer store? Costco. Costco. Y'all can't, does any of y'all marbling look like that? No. It looks red as a damn apple, don't it? <laughs> and it ain't got no fat content in it. That makes a difference, folks. I'm telling you, that makes a difference. you got to have that fat content. And the way we're doing right here, we're going to talk a little bit about what a brisket actually is. We already had somebody to do the hard work for us. We've done a little trim work on it. A brisket's really two pieces of meat. You got two pieces of meat. The brisket's right here in the chest of the cow. It tucks about 80% of the weight. That's why it's always considered a working muscle. It's tougher. It actually is tougher. But the thing about it is, that's the challenge of being able to cook a brisket and make it tender, make it moist, make it flavorful. Well, the thing about it is, y'all look right here, especially in the front, you can see which way is that grain running. From me to y'all. Y'all see that? I'm just gonna pick it straight up. The grain's running up and down or out in front, just like this. All I'm gonna do is roll it. Now y'all remember that's that fat, it's all right here in membrane, it's been trimmed away. I'm just gonna roll it. Now, this is the point. Which way is that grain running? Ooh, side to right. side. So it's really two pieces of meat, but the challenge is, is to make them both perfect, tender, done. Now, Everybody's heard of the slices that come from brisket. Comes from up here, we're going to call this our flat. This portion right here is our flat. Right here for those in the back. That's the flat right there where we're going to get our slices. How many of y'all ever heard of burnt ends? Yeah. yeah. It's a big thing. It's originating in Kansas City. Burnt ends is double-sided bark, little cubes of goodness. Got a lot of edible fat that's rendered down almost where it melts in your mouth. Those portions come from right here on that point where the side to side grain runs because this is where most of the fat is in this brisket is right here. So that's where you're going to get that goodness. For me, when I'm doing injection, it's just a basic injection. Take about 32 ounces of high water. I don't know if anybody knows the product. It's called Miners, M-I-N-O-R apostrophe S. Find it on Amazon. You find it at soupbase.com, but it's Miner's Beef Base. It's a paste. It comes a little jar like this, actual beef products in it. Then they got another product, it's got Beef Au Jus, Miner's. 
two tablespoons each of hot water, and I inject. Put about half of the 32 ounces up here in the flat, flip it over, put the other half of the 32 ounces over here in the point. Now, when you're injecting, how many of y'all ever injected a brisket? How many of y'all, after you got through injecting, you done your slice, it was done and cooked, you can see your needle holes or you can see where you stained it? That's caused from injecting across the grain. If you inject with the grain and not across it, you won't have those needle holes up here, which is not going to hurt the flavor. The needle holes not going to affect the uh, flavor, but it's not, and it, it being a little dark, it's not going to affect it. But the thing about it is, guys and gals, you don't spend the money to get the best brisket there is. Why not do it right and make it perfect all throughout? It's going to taste good, make it look good. We want good taste of barbecue, but we don't want good taste of barbecue. It looks like Fido's ass. <laughs> Spend the extra time and do it right. So we inject with the grain. What I would do, I'd look at that brisket right there. Look at it on the grid like a checkerboard, like a three quarter of inch grid. And I'd hit those grids, the squares. Boom, 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 boom. Injecting with the grain. I'd roll over, get my point. Injecting with the grain, same way, look at it in the grid pattern. Once we get it done, I look down, I take me some olive oil, I rub it right here where my exposed meat's at, both sides, then I apply my rub. I use the olive oil to adhere the rub to the meat. I do not like to use mustard. To me, mustard's a strong flavor profile. Leave the damn mustard for your hot dog. Don't be putting it on your meat. I know we probably got some out here competing today, but they don't know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> don't screw with the mustard. Plus, mustard stains my black shirts and you can't get the shit out. <laughs> there you go. But I'm going to tell you something. Olive oil, put your rub on it, but when you apply your rub, don't do what the rub sounds like. Don't rub it. Because if you do what you'll do, you'll roll the seasoning, you make it thick on one end, and you'll take away from another if you don't like rolling it. You see what I'm talking about? So just push down on it. Y'all know that damn insurance commercial? Salt and pepper. Push it real good. <laughs> baby, baby. You heard that? You know Salt and Pepper did that commercial they back on tour again. <laughs> and leave me out there. Do the video. Yeah, they should hurry you. But no, you do it on both sides. I like to get it ready. Now we got our brisket ready to go on the smoker. For me, I like to run my briskets hot compared to what a lot of people do. And I'm cooking on my water cookers. Power mix and smoker, I H2O series. I got a water pan. I got vents on either side of the water pan, the firebox. The wood I use hits the bottom of that water pan with the flame, steams that water, but around the vents, it's letting the smoke come around it. So I'm tenderizing while I'm barbecuing at the same time. I'm running at 300 degrees. 300. I put it on the pit, 300 degrees. I'm letting it roll and get that smoke. For the first hour, I'm not doing anything to it except laying it right out there on that rack. Letting that rub set. That's bat side up or down? Bat side down. Reason that is, the fat cap that I left is protecting the flat where I'm going to get my slices. And that heat's coming from the bottom, so it's going to hit that and protect. The slices. I like to use when I'm at home, I like to use hickory and oak, a little bit of peach wood. You know, this weekend we use cherry, we use apple, which are great woods too. But I tell people when they ask that question in my classes, the wood of choice is, is what you can get readily available. There's a lot of great barbecue woods. It's not one over one another. There's a lot of great ones. Because your earliest pit masters, I, I mean, they couldn't get online and order. So they had to use what they had. Right, exactly. You know, the first barbecue pit masters out there, they were about feeding large families cheap. So they took the livestock they had on the farm. They took the forest they had as fuel. They took what they had in the root cellar seasons like pepper flakes. They distilled vinegars. That's what they had. It wasn't about wanting to be on TV because there wasn't no damn TV. Sometimes I wish we had no damn TV now. <laughs> but the thing about it is, once we set that rub, it's been on that one hour at 300 degrees, then we start spritzing. Now, I don't want that bark to get dried out before I wrap. So I'm going to spritz this brisket about every 15 minutes for the next hour. 
Well, I like to spritz with just beef broth and a little brown sugar. The reason I like it, beef broth is a flavor that's already on here. I mean, it's a beef flavor. So I've got beef broth. It's going to keep that bark moist. The sugar, the dark brown sugar, has got a molasses in it. So it's going to help caramelize and make a bark. It's going to start making a bark. You want a good crusty bark on there. So we're going to do that every 15 minutes for the second hour. Coming up on the third hour. Second hour, we're done. I take it and I put it in a pan. I cover it tight, put it back on the smoke at 300 degrees. I'm going to finish cooking it until I get 200, 205 degrees right here at the point. Right here. That's going to make me know I, my brisket's ready. And when that pin, that needle falls in there for my meat thermometer, slides like butter, then you're going to be able to know it hits 205, I'm ready to go. The reason I like to pan it instead of just wrapping it, when this brisket starts rendering, it's pushing. It's pushing out fat, grease, oil, au jus, natural au jus out of these briskets. And because it's Snake River Farms, a lot of fat content, it's going to be a lot of natural au jus. I want to catch it in this pan because I'm going to reserve it and use it later on and run it through my grease separator, separate the oil from the au jus, and dip my brisket slices and my burn ends down in the au jus. So I put it in the pan after two hours. I've done my spritz for an hour, covering it tight to finish up the cooking process. It's gonna take about two more hours to do that at 300 degrees. Once I reach that, I'm gonna wrap it up in a blanket or put it in a holding box where my brisket can rest. I'm gonna tell you something. You can do everything right, right up to this point. You can do the right injection, you can fit the right meat, right cooker, do it all right. But if you don't let this meat rest properly, you just screw the whole cook. You gotta let it rest. Two hours at least, four hours is better. Let it rest, that's gonna let it start sucking all the flavor in instead of rendering where it's pushing out. But you let it rest, brings that flavor back into the meat, it tenderizes it on up to a state of tenderness like you want, then it's ready to slice. Two hours minimum, four hours at the most. Sorry. What the hell are you? <laughs> yeah, like you own this damn place. <laughs> Just chicken. What do you do to let it rest? Keep I keep, I, I leave box. it in the pan covered in the foil or I put it in the holding box. I like moving blankets. You buy five bucks a piece. I brought a couple with me out here. I don't have a lot of money like some folks around here, Sterling. What did you say about me again? You can't afford these cameras and stuff, the holding boxes, so I need a little cheap. I only have one mama, one dad. I'm a poor country boy from South Georgia. And I wrap it up and let it rest in it. It keeps it hot, but it still lets the temperature drop where it can suck all those juices back into the brisket. And you can let it rest just in the pan, too. So yes, that's why you leave it in the pan. Yeah, you leave it, yeah, you leave it covered. Like covered. Yeah, you don't want to take it out of the pan and wrap that in a damn blanket. <laughs> <laughs> you have fuzzy wuzzies all over your damn brisket. <laughs> you don't want no fuzzy wuzzies. <laughs> hey, Myron, can yeah. we change the subject for a second? To what? Who was your favorite contestant on season two? My favorite contestant? Yeah. Yeah, man! <laughs> that was a trick question. The guy that said that, he threw me out. No, he called me a goddamn tailgate. <laughs> I did. Oh. I thought we were beyond that, Sterling, now. I yeah, well, we were... easy for you to disparage me and then we're asking. Go ahead, Tuffy. I'm Tuffy. Go ahead, John. Oh! But anyway, we got a brisket, we got it off, it's resting. We're going to let it rest for two to four hours. Now we're coming to the point, we had uh, some of the guys over here on the uh, smokers in the corner that's been cooking all day. They cooked up a brisket for us. Now, now, hand me that blade. I think you dropped it. Blade. Now, when you're getting ready to do the slices, me, for contest, you always want to make sure you remove that fat off. I mean, but for me at home, I leave the fat on there. I mean, the fat to me, when I get a steak, like a T-bone especially, I don't take that fat tail off. I eat it. I mean, shit, you got to die from something. You know? <laughs> 
I didn't even shake it. it tastes good. <laughs> but you go in and you got the grain. See how that grain's running right here? You always want to cut across the grain. I've seen people before and you think that's one of the first things you know, but it, it's something you got to remember. And the thing is, you're not going to get everything the first time you start barbecuing. It takes time. You're going to make mistakes. The only person that never has made a mistake before is Sterling. Sterling never has made a mistake. <laughs> and Tuffy, Tuffy never makes mistakes. But anyway, you got the grain running side to side. You always want to cut across that grain. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to step up here. See what we got going on. You want to make it. Everybody remember what a number two yellow pencil used to be? Mm -hmm. I'm glad y'all remember. You got young as now going to school, graduating from high school, can't even write cursive. That's in the damn state of Georgia. My damn nephew graduated last year in college and cannot write his name in cursive. They don't teach it no more. But you want to slice these slices, a number two, a number yellow, number two yellow pencil wide. Now, I know this guy's done a good job. See how that just pulled? See that little elastic pop? See it? Y'all see how it's stretching and then pow. There you go. Hand me a pan up here, good deal. Yeah, I'm gonna sauce some up right quick. We're gonna toss it and then we put it in the in the pans. Just like that. So that's been sitting for four hours. Good be if you'll glove up and hit yeah, the Yeah, these have, these have been on. That, that's these been have actually been in the on. box for four hours. I yeah, mean, but these have rested. rested. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anybody ever took a steak, you sear it off hot and fast, lay it on your plate too damn quick and cut it, where's all the juice go? You gotta let it rest enough to where it starts sucking it back, where that damn juice and all that flavor stays in that piece of meat. You don't want to cut it and it runs all over the table because you have just wasted the flavor. If you'll follow these recipes like I've talked about and do it right, you'll have some great barbecue. If you don't, You'll wind up with barbecue that tastes like cat food and ass. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't want that. Byron, how much do you slice before you separate the points? Before you separate it out? Yeah. Now, when I'm doing it, I cook the point on it. And when I get through, I go and clean that piece off down there, and then I got bark on one side. But I let it rest a couple hours, and then I bring it out of the holding box, then I take it off, clean off that fat that was attached, season it, put it on so it can get barked. Then on what? The other side. So then I got, when I'm after an hour, I got a two-sided piece of bark of, of the point. Then I slice it into cubes. That wasn't done with No, that's the one cleaned off that way. Let me ask you a question. Where's the burnt ends? That's the burnt ends would be right down here, but they did clean this one off. Oh, the, oh okay. If we this wasn't one I actually cooked myself. They did a good job with it. Though. Okay, I got you. So that that's it's not as easy to sample side. them out when you do burnt ends and slices. Right, right. Okay, I'm just this is that. Okay, gotcha. Somebody had some burnt ends. There might have been some. There might have been some burnt ends. I got you. <laughs> I've got you. That's all good. I do. So let me ask you another question. Okay, so we let it rest for four hours. Nice. Do you recommend reheating? And if you were going to reheat it, what, how would you do it? Any bad? Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's been resting for four hours. So. Need some peach wood. Oh, it's, it's still be hot. When you let it rest in the blankets, like I'm talking about, oh, in the blank, right. and you unwrap it, it's still hit. You probe it, it's still hit 160, 170 degrees. Oh, okay, okay. Gotcha. It's not going to get down to where it gets cold. How about, let's take it out of this. Okay, I'm all done eating. All right, the next day I still have a lot left. Um, how, would, how do you recommend heating it? If I was going to re-therm this, if I just got through getting this brisket and we done ate all we can eat and my ass can't eat no more, and I got right, this one right. cut up. If you got a vacuum seal machine, that's the best way to do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Let me tell you what you need to do. Order for your vacuum seal machine, just the strictly for barbecue, uh, boilable bags. A little more expensive, but you get the boilable bags. Right, right. You put it in like two or five pounds to a little bag. You can freeze it, whatever, vacuum seal it down. You get ready for it. You get your pot of boiling water. You drop that damn bag over there for 20 minutes. You take your scissors and bring it out. And I just about will bet you money it's about as good as the day you cook it. That's the best way to do it is the vacuum seal it. Now, if you've had some in the refrigerator, you did it. The way to re-therm it, you got a bunch of it. Let's say pulled pork or whatever. 
you got in the pan covered in full. The best way to do it is turn your oven on 200, slide it in, and let it come up slow. slow. Don't put it in at 300. If you do, it's going to burn the meat around the edge. It's going to dry out the slices. Right. But you want it to come up slow. Okay. Thank you. You want slice? Sure. They don't want to hear from me. They want to. They want to hear from you. They don't want to listen to me. Anybody got any questions? When you put it in the pan, do you put it fat cap down too? Fat cap down, and I always, I always like to work fat cap down. I know a lot of folks talk about fat cap up and that magic brisket with the damn fat. It's gonna melt through. <laughs> so, let me tell you, that fat cap's that thick. Do y'all really believe? In your cooking time, that damn fat's gonna melt through the middle of that brisket. <laughs> it ain't happening. The it. fat that you're gonna taste in that brisket is gonna be that marbling that's already there. God put it and there, the that's the part you're gonna have. Right, that's because of the good meat. Yeah, it's, it's about the meat. Always remember it's about the meat. Everybody, who's out here a computer person? Garbage in, garbage out. You heard that? Barbecue is very relatable. If you don't start out with good meat, you're gonna have shit ass barbecue. If you start out with good barbecue, well, good meat, you're gonna have great barbecue. And you can't get any better in State River Farm or Wagyu. I mean, I'm just telling you. Not shitting you, I'm just telling you the way it is. Where's State Farm located? State Farm. State River Farm. State River Farm. State Farm. We're not selling damn insurance. I got it. Need to break it up in pieces and toss it in the sauce. I'd hit it with the spritz, too. You need to be quick about it because this crowd's growling. <laughs> They're like dangerous. A, they like a pack of wild dogs. It's dangerous out here. Okay, so 15. <laughs> <laughs> what?